Okay, any other questions? <coughs> any questions about the midterm, about the, any other thing that we were covering? Now your friend was, what was your name, Merve? Merve, Merve was proposing that maybe we should have some uh, problem solving sessions. Not regularly, but from time to time, whenever you feel the need. And my proposal would be, I mean, we can have it whenever you, ha you want to have it, but just arrange among yourselves at least three, four students, well, let's say two, three, you are not that crowded, two, three students, if you just uh, fix a time that's suitable for you, suitable for me, and say that you would like to solve some sample problems, it can be the homework problems, the exam problems, or any other problems that, have it, <coughs> that come to your mind, we can just sit and discuss some problems. But you do the organization. She will do the organization, let's say. Okay, so <clears throat> if you remember what we were looking at up to last week, we were mainly working in Hilbert space. <clears throat> we were dealing with uh, op abstract operators acting on our kids in the Hilbert space. But last week, we started uh, writing the Schrodinger equation, which is nothing but a differential equation that corresponds to our operators, our equations in the Hilbert space, and we had seen that the differential equation that the wave function satisfies, satisfies should have this form. <coughs> this is in three dimensions. This is the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. We can write the time-independent version which is based nothing but an eigenvalue equation. And we had also discussed that if we are looking for a solution of this differential equation for which E is less than the limit of the potential at infinity, now for a general value, I mean, this differential equation has <coughs> solutions, whatever the value of E is. There is no discrete, discreteness inherent in the equation. It is the boundary conditions which brings us this discretization of the energy. Because for a general value of the energy, if this condition is satisfied, then the uh, asymptotic behavior of the wave function as R goes to infinity will, will either have this form or it will have this form. This will be how the, our solution will behave at infinity for a general value of E. But such wave functions are not normalizable. Their integral will be over all space will diverge. They will not be finite. Only for special values of E, we will have uh, normalizable solutions. So that is where the uh, discreteness of the energy or any other eigenvalue, in fact, comes from. So it's the boundary conditions mainly that causes that discretization. Now, we, today we will be doing some simple examples, like the free particle. Now, the, Hamil the uh, Hamiltonian for our free particle is just p squared over 2m. Now, let's just do it in, in, no, in 3D. And the nice thing about this is that it commutes with all the components of the momentum. So the first thing we can do is we can try to diagonalize the momentum rather than the Hamiltonian. We had already seen that if we have commuting operators, if we diagonalize one of them, and if there is no degeneracy, then the other one is automatically diagonalized. The advantage of the, the linear momentum is that it is first order differential equation. So let's diagonalize P. And the uh, differential equation, the, uh, so Psi should satisfy this equation, the eigenstates, minus I H bar del over del Xi should be Pi Psi. Uh, this is the eigenvalue equation for Pi. Pi being the, here the, this Pi being the eigenvalue so the wave function should be i over h bar e to the power i over h bar pi xi. Yeah, here there, 
here there is no sum over i here there is a, a sum over i are you familiar with Einstein's summation convention so we repeated indices they are summed over well of course this is not normalized so we should put some and so psi of r we can also write it in the form with our normalization constant times e to the power i over h bar p dot r you see this is the eigenvalue equation of the momentum and there is no discreteness of the momentum neither a discreteness of the Hamiltonian so Hamiltonian acting on this psi would just give me p squared over 2m times psi. So this is the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is also diagonalized now. Now for simplicity, let's just assume that we have a finite box, a cubical box. L, L, L. So we have a box. And we know that the proper normalization condition will be d cubed r psi squared should be 1. But you see, psi is some constant times the phase. So this psi squared is nothing but and squared. So if you just put it in this equation, we have d cubed r and squared should be 1. n squared is just a constant. This integral is just n squared l cubed should be 1. If we choose n to be a real number, well, we can always multiply by a phase r wave function. So if n, somebody chooses n to be a complex number, so it has a fixed phase, we can just multiply by the inverse of it, so we can make it real. And if we choose it to be real, n is just 1 over l square root of l cubed. So this is our normalized wave function. Still there is no discreteness, there is no quantization of the momentum, neither of the energy. That will come when we impose some boundary conditions. Now there are a couple of things we can do to impose the boundary condition. One we can either, I mean, eventually we will be considering the limit L goes to infinity, free particle somewhere, not restricted in a finite volume. Oops, sorry. So what we would like to have is that we have this box, our particles should be always in our box. So either we can say that psi of r is equal to zero on the boundary of the box, this is one condition, this is called the zero boundary condition, or we can say that psi of r plus nx x hat plus n y, y hat plus n z, z hat multiplied by L is equal to psi of r. So this is called the periodic boundary condition. Basically, one of them says that you have a box which has uh, infinite, you, are, you have infinite potential out of your box, so the, your particle cannot go out. The sec that, that the, the zero boundary condition, the second, the periodic boundary condition tells us that, okay, you don't have this uh, infinite potential, but basically all of the universe is covered with, with identical boxes, and whenever a particle is leaving your box from, let's say, the left-hand su surface, an identical particle enters from the right-hand surface. So eventually, which 
in, in the limit when you take the L goes to infinity, well, both of them should give you exactly the same physical results. Because <coughs> Well, you see, the potential is infinite everywhere outside. In the tunneling phenomena, what happens is you have this potential barrier. On, on one side of this barrier, it's classically allowed, but the other side of the barrier is also classically allowed. That's what we call the tunneling phenomena. But here, there is no other side. The other side always in the zero boundary condition case. The other side is always zero, in infinite. The potential so classical, there is no allowed region on the other side. Of course, you can still say that, okay, why not have a tail, maybe, extended out of our box? But you see, if you look at our differential equation, this is the time independent, this is the equation that we are considering. You see, out of our box, in the zero boundary condition case, out of the box, the V is infinite. You see, if you just apply this differential equation on a point outside our box, E is finite, V is infinite, and the derivative of psi, you either say that the derivative is infinite, well, that also doesn't make sense. So the derivatives will also be finite. So the only possibility that this equation is satisfied is if psi is zero. So you have the psi times in, uh, zero times infinity uncertainty, which can be a finite number. Or psi is zero. If psi is zero, it automatically satisfies this differential equation. So that is because V of R is infinite, and you still want to satisfy this equation. Of course, but you see, the problem that we are actually considering that we would like to consider is free particle, not constrained by anything. So we will be eventually taking the limit L goes to infinity. So the particle will never be able to reach there. So it doesn't really matter uh, what boundary conditions we impose at infinity. The only thing you have to make sure is that your particle stays in your volume because my particle will stay in the universe. It cannot go to a parallel universe. At least that's not what we are studying here. So that is the only criteria we have. As long as you make sure that the particle stays in your box, just impose whichever boundary condition you like. Well, I will be using this periodic boundary condition mainly because it also gives us the... Uh, no, I mean, it doesn't really matter which one you use, really. But you see, the problem with the zero boundary condition is that you, see, you cannot have a solution of your... Um, you cannot have a momentum against state with zero boundary condition. That's, that's kind of the problem. Okay, we said that the uh, momentum against state commits, momentum operator commits with the Hamiltonian, but momentum operator cannot be diagonalized with this boundary condition. That's also another problem with the zero boundary condition. Because you see, momentum is a translation. If you have your zero box over here, if you translate it, now the problem is different. So translation changes the boundary condition boundary conditions are fixed. So the momentum doesn't really, in a sense, commit with our, it commits with the Hamiltonian, but not with the boundary conditions we have. So that's also another reason why we will be using the periodic boundary conditions, because well, you can just think of this uh, periodic boundary conditions as that you have this box, just next to it there is the identical box. So if you just translate it, translate your box slightly, well, this part of the box is now removed, it is over here though. So this part is identical to this part. So this boundary condition, in that sense, commutes with our translation operator. Let me plot it over here. I have this box, this identical. I have identical copies of my box. So if you translate it, 
This is what you obtain. This is our, your new box. But you see, there is an identical copy of that new box over here, another identical copy over here, another identical copy over here. This is identical to here. So your new box is again identical. It has the same number of particles, same eigenkets, etc. Okay, long story short, we will stick with this periodic boundary condition. Now, what does that imply for our momentum, eigen, momentum eigenvalues? You see, we have e to power psi of r is 1 over L cubed e to power i over h bar p dot r. Psi of r plus, let me use this notation, n times L, n being a vector which has integer components. Etc. This should be equal to psi of r. But this basically tells me that e to the power i over h bar p dot n l should be equal to 1. Well, this condition tells me that P, let's see, <coughs> P dot N L, 1 over H bar, which will be <coughs> Nx Px plus Ny Py plus Nz Pz times L over H bar, this should be some multiple of 2 pi. For all values of Nx, Nx, Ny, and Nz. Well, <coughs> let's just look at some special cases. Now, in fact, not for all values of nx, ny, and z, sorry. I made a mistake over there. nx, ny, and nz, 0 or 1. Yes, I'm just translating by L in the x direction, or in the y direction, or in the z direction. It should repeat itself. So that tells me that px should be h over L times 2 pi times, let me use another notation, mx py 2 pi h bar over L my and pz is equal to 2 pi h bar over L mz. Here mx, my, mz. These are 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2, etc. Now we have the discretization. But you see, discretization came because we imposed some boundary condition. Where? Well, you see, I looked at this case. Well, this tells me that Px L over H bar should be a multiple of 2 pi or I call that mult 2 pi, it should be a multiple of 2 pi. I call that mx. So this gave me px should be equal to 2 pi h bar over L mx. And then I looked at the other cases where ny was 1 and the others were 0, and nz is 1 and the others are 0.
You see, I have this condition. This exponential should be 1. This is to, true only if the exponential is an integer multiple of 2 pi. Otherwise, that exponent will not be 1. This one. That's why I had to, they have to be an integer multiple of 2 pi. Well, you see, what we are actually looking at was uh, this is my box. Let's say this is the x direction. My wave function is a function of x, y, and z. If I translate by L in the x, or if I translate by L in the y, or if I translate by L in the Z, I should get the same wave function. This is what we mean by periodic boundary conditions. So you see here, this NX, NY, and NZ, only one of them are, is one. The other ones are zero. So you are right. If I want, if I just let the, I mean, when you are, for example, in, if any one of you working in condensed matter physics, for example, in, in on the lattices, what you have is you have to, you might, you want to have a symmetry uh, for any translation, not necessarily just one, one unit of translation. Here we want a symmetry for one unit of translation. So on the, on the lattice. You just let these nx, ny, and nz to be any integer, not just one. But that means you want your wave function to somehow repeat itself, let's say, either after one lattice translation, or after two lattice translations, or three lattice translations, etc. Because of the symmetry of your lattice. But here we are having a different problem. We are modeling the universe. So we have this cube. So we put a second cube, and that second cube should be identical to our first cube. That is what we want. And there's another cube over here, etc. So we want all these cubes to be identical, not just symmetric. Now, we want them to be identical, mainly because to we want to conserve the number of particles inside. So if you have this cube, if one particle is leaving from this, this surface, then an identical particle should be entering from the other surface so that the total number of particles will be fixed. So now we have the, our eigenvalues, the wave functions. Let me de use this notation now to denote, to denote the momentum eigenvalue. This is 1 over square root of L cubed e to power i p i over h bar p dot r, where p can take the values 2 pi h bar over l m x m y m z. You see, for example, the x value of this momentum eigenvalue can take discrete values. But the distance difference between these two discrete values is proportional to 1 over L. Eventually, when we take the limit L goes to infinity, that's the whole universe, without any uh, bounding boxes, then the this, this, uh, difference goes to 0. mx plus 1 minus 2 pi h bar over L times mx. This is equal to... 2 pi h bar over L, which goes to 0 in the limit L goes to infinity. 
So this, the discreteness is, disappears when we take the infinite universe limit. Now we can look at the inner product, d cubed r. Yes? If you get the x, you get the px shell, and it's probably a solution to the end. Now, you see, this delta px is the difference between two possible momentum eigenstates. So, in a sense, it measures the discreteness of the momentum eigenvalues. Delta px goes to zero just means that the, there is no discreteness left the spectrum is co becomes continuous. Now, delta px is not the change in the momentum of the particle as time evolves. So, for example, if delta px is the change in the momentum of the particle as time, go time goes by, and if that goes to zero, that in that case we have what you say, that as the particle is moving, it doesn't lose any momentum. But it's not this delta px is not that one. It has nothing to do with the time evolution of the state. This is how I define my delta px. Well, let's look at this one. possible values of px. Okay, for, if L is very small, this is one possible value, this is another value, this is another value, this is another value, etc. Okay? So as L changes, the minimum possible value except than zero, you see px is 2 pi h bar over L mx. This corresponds to mx is equal to 1, this is mx is equal to 2, this is mx is equal to 3, mx is equal to 4. Well, this just goes as 1 over L. This also goes as 1 over L. This also goes as 1 over L. This goes as 1 over L. And we have other states. You see, the splitting between the energy momentum eigenvalues, it goes to zero. No, it's just an observation. I'm not driving any other conclusions. It's, I'm just saying that without the boundary conditions, the spectrum is continuous. With the boundary condition, the spectrum is discrete. There is no deeper physical significance that I'm trying to uh, tell. Yes? Now let's calculate the density of states. What we mean by density of states. You see, the, <coughs> the same thing happens for the energy eigenvalues. The chain difference in the energy between two different uh, levels This will be uh, okay, 1 over 2m, momentum eigenvalues are 2 pi h bar over L squared times n prime squared minus n squared. Or m. This is the splitting between two nearby. m and n prime, they just are three vectors. such that the, their energy is very close to each other. But you see, L goes to, as L goes to infinity, 
this goes to zero. So again, the energy, uh, discreteness of the energy also disappears in the infinite volume limit. Now, for a realistic system, let's see, uh, it doesn't have an infinite volume. But nevertheless, the energy states will be highly dense. Highly dense. So there will be, if you, let's say, if you look at a state which has a, uh, if you look at the number of states that have an energy in the interval E and E plus, let's say, uh, 5 electron volt and 5.1 electron volts, there will be an enormous number of states. And so the energy spectrum it will be almost continuous. Almost. Not exactly continuous, but almost continuous. We won't be able to really uh, distinguish the discreteness of the energy eigenvalues. And when you study statistical mechanics, for example, you will see that you are summing over some functions that depend, the partition function is our fundamental object in statistical physics, and the partition function is just nothing but a summation over some function that depends only on the energy. So basically, in statistical mechanics, you, you want to have sum over states of some function that depends only on the energy. So basically, instead of this sum over states, we can split into two parts. This is equal to sum over all energies and sum over states, sum over energies E, and number of sum over states that have energy E. This again will be just the sum over all the states. Now, usually, you see, whether you have a state that has an energy E or E plus dE, your function doesn't really change much. F of E is, is constant, more or less. Now, this F of E is constant. Furthermore, since in the summation, F of we are summing over states with having a fixed energy, we can just take it out. We are summing over one. So this, that summation will be sum over energies E, possible energies, times F of E times the number of states having energy E. Well, you see, E will be almost continuous. So if E is almost continuous, then the summation over continuous parameters doesn't really make sense. So summation only makes sense for uh, discrete quantities. When you take the limit that that discrete quantity becomes a uh, continuous parameter, summation will just become integrations. So you see here what we do is number of states having energy E, Instead of that, what we do is sum over discrete energies EI times F of EI. And this number of states, this is the number of states having energy in the interval EI and EI plus delta E. Now, we will be assuming that delta E is very small. But nevertheless, since delta E is a finite number, this, so basically what we are doing is we have this continuous energy spectrum, or almost continuous. We are discretizing it. We are saying that, OK, I will just look at these discrete energy eigenvalues, E0, E1, EI, 
They are separated by delta E. I will eventually take the limit as delta E goes to zero. Now, this number of states within that integral will be proportional to delta E, and that number is what we call GE times delta E. This is the density of states. So this sum over states of this energy dependent function now becomes sum over EI of F of EI times G of EI times delta E. Now we will take the limit as delta E goes to zero. We are taking the continuum limit. In the continuum limit, this is nothing but the definition of the uh, integration. So it just becomes integral of over the energies of F of E times G of E. So that's why we, this density of states will be an important property in studying especially systems which has a, like condensed matter systems, which has a large degree of freedom almost continuous energy spectrum. We can replace the sum over the states as an integ or, uh, replace it with an integral over the energies. Now, of course, the first thing we have to do is determine number of states having energy in a given interval. Well, you see, what we are considering here is not necessarily harmonic oscillator because harmonic oscillator is basically a finite size system because the potential just restricts our system to almost a finite size. Here, what I am considering is a system that has whose size is almost infinite. Since it is almost infinite, energy spectrum is actually not continuous, or not discrete, it's almost continuous. So I should be able to replace that sum of our states with an integration. So that's basically some of the tricks that I do. Although L is very large, so the energies are uh, uh, continuous, almost, almost continuous, I can nevertheless still create discreteness in a sense, uh, in an ad hoc way. I, I put that discreteness. How I do that, I have this continuous energy spectrum, I just divide it into parts. So I just group them, one group one, group two, group three, group four. So that is what I did in, the, in this step over here. So that summation makes sense. I, have a, I, I need some finite terms. But then, of, you see, <coughs> I'm considering this group, although there are many, energy sta many different states in that group, I'm just considering it all of them to have the same energy. They don't have the same energy, they have a slight difference, but nevertheless, look at my function f of e. Most of the time, all the time, it will be a continuous function. If delta e is very small, f of e has the same value in this group. You see, within this group, f of e is almost f of e zero, let's say. So that is constant. So that's why I could just replace f of e by f of ei just take one representative in this group of states. And, and then, of course, if I want to, uh, this now, before I had the number of states having energy exactly E, now I should multiply this F of E I with the number of states having energy within a given interval. Because for all of them, I'm just considering the F to be E I, and I'm basically summing each group separately each energy group, I'm summing them separately so that I discretize it somehow. In a sense, the average of, this, of each one of these groups. Now, let's do an example to calculate this density of states. Maybe it will make more sense then.
Now, let me make a definition first. Let me call an E to be the number of states having energy less than E. Not in a given interval, but less than E. So, number of once I evaluate that number of states having energy in the interval E and E plus delta E, this would be just N of E plus delta E minus N of E. So if I calculate that N of E, I can just evaluate this thing. But now this, by definition, is the density of states times delta E. And the density of states is just this difference divided by delta E in the limit delta E goes to zero. So this is nothing but the derivative of this function with respect to E. So once I evaluate that function, I'm basically done. Number. Yes. N is a number, as your friend points out. N is just 1, 2, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, 1 million, 1 million, and 1, etc. So it's not a continuous function, it's a discrete function. So how can you take the derivative of a discrete function? Let's look at a case when we have two dimensions, not three dimensions. There it will be easy to see. mx, my. Each integer value of mx and my will correspond to an energy eigenstate. So if I count the number of integer values of mx and my, well, let me put it this way, 1 over 2 m. 2 pi h bar over L squared, mx squared plus my squared should be less than E. So I need to count the possible values of mx and my for which this condition is satisfied. Or mx squared plus my squared should be less than 2m times L over 2 pi h bar squared times E. This condition should be satisfied. Well, you can also, if you want, you can also put the equality sign. It doesn't really make any difference. Well, this is a disk. So given an energy value, this just defines a disk in the mx and y plane. So you need, so this is my disk. And possible values of mx and my that corresponds to an energy eigenstate will be mx1, 2, 3, 4, 5, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5. Similarly for my. Well, the intersection points are just these dots. This is also possible. So basically, we need to count the number of points, number of dots in that point. Well, there's also this one. Let me just call this number r squared. This is my r. Let me plot now n of e as a function of r. Well, if r is 0, there is only this state. Until r becomes 1, n of e is just 1. Well, when r becomes 1, n of e just becomes 4.
until it's one point, square root of two. When r becomes square root of two, uh, it becomes eight. So it's this step function. Okay, already at square root of two, <coughs> you see one thing. The separation of the jumps becomes smaller. So you see here we have a jump from zero, zero to one. There is no jump between zero to one. And there is no jump between one and 1.4. The jump became even smaller. The next jump will be even the, uh, the difference in r until the next jump will be even smaller. So the next jump will be somewhere over here. So eventually this function, <laughs> these jumps, the difference between the jumps will get smaller and smaller and smaller. So you won't be able to see the difference. Well, let me just replot it in a different scale. This is one. This is square root of two. The next jump is somewhere over here. So eventually what it becomes is a function that is almost continuous. If you just would take a magnifying glass or a microscope and look at it, it of course still has these jumps, has, takes only discrete values, but it, the function is now almost a continuous function. Now if you look at over here this delta E, you see delta E in principle shouldn't go to zero because still we have discreteness as long as L is finite. The states are discrete. So we cannot take the limit as delta E goes to zero. It just doesn't exist. But the possible values of delta E, especially if E is large, you see over here, E is also increasing significantly for large values of E. That discreteness becomes almost zero. But for those values of delta E, N E becomes almost a continuous function. In this sense, it is a derivative. Of course, it won't be a derivative if you are, let's say, there will be corrections to it, let's say. You see, here, you will get corrections to that term, which will go as 1 over E. Will be negligible for large energy values. And also, they will go to zero as L goes to zero. L goes to infinity, sorry. So there are corrections to this. The corrections which you can actually calculate, in fact, which we are ignoring. Well, let's go back over here. How can we count them? Count the number of dots. Well, you see, if you look at that graph right over there, around each dot, I can imagine a square of side length one. So there's another square over here, another square over here, another square over here. There's no gap between these squares because each dot is separated by one in the x, one in the y, and one unit in the z direction. Since these squares have a side length one, when one ends, the other one starts. So there's no gap between these ones. But that means that these squares, they cover my disk. Every point in my disk is close to some, some uh, square in some square, not close to in some square. So counting the number of dots is almost the same thing as counting the number of squares. Almost because 
squares have also some parts that are outside my disk. But the number of squares is approximately the number of dots. Now, how many squares I have? Just calculate the area. Is approximately again pi r squared over 1. Pi r squared is the area of the disk. 1 is the area of each one of these squares. So if I divide pi r squared by 1, I approximately get the number of squares inside my disk. Well, this is not the exact number. Basically because of disks, because of squares on the circumference. There are some squares on the circumference which are half out, half in. I should count some of them, I should not count some, some other ones because some of them will have their dot inside my disk, some of them will have my dot outside my disk. So this number is not exact, but it's an approximate <coughs> number. Well, <coughs> the number of squares on the circumference Typically, what do you expect? Well, you see, there is a part of the circumference inside my squares. That part has a length, let's say, around 1, because my square has side length 1. As for some of them, it will be 1.4. For some of them, it will be smaller. If, only the, if it touches only on the edge, but typically on the average, I would expect the average part of the circumference inside a rectangle, inside the square, should have length 1. Well, the circumference has a length 2 pi r. So this is the number of squares that lie on the, my sphere or disk, on the circumference of the disk in this two-dimensional example. But you see, especially if r is large, well, what does it mean to have r large l goes to infinity, for example, and e being finite? That, that makes r huge. So you see, that error will be negligible compared to the actual number. Percentage error will go to zero, eventually. So that's why I can just ignore those things. Of course, as you, as you pointed out, they bring corrections if L is not infinite or R is not very large. But for the sake of simplicity, we will just ignore them. Well, we can just generalize it, this to our three-dimensional example. You see, the generalization to this equation for the three-dimensional example We have mz squared. So n of e, let me say this is r squared. n of e is, now we don't have squares, we have cubes, because we are in three dimensions. Well, we, have the, we don't have a disk, we have a sphere. What is the volume of the sphere? Four thirds pi r cubed. This is the volume of my cube, well, volume of my sphere. Well, the volume of one cube is one, so I should divide by one. This is equal to four over three pi r cube. And no, let me just replace r, two m l over two pi h bar squared e to the power three halves. This is n of e, the number of density of states in three dimensions. 
But again, as you pointed out, this is just an approximation, a kind of a fit to our uh, stepwise function. It just gives approximate values. The exact function has, as you said, steps. But now I can calculate the density of states. 4 over 3 pi 2m l over 2 pi h bar squared to the power 3 halves times 3 halves e to the power 1 half. By the way, this is proportional to L cubed also. That's the volume. Now let's, any questions up to this point? Now let's just look at one more thing and then we can give a break and finish this uh, free particle example. Let's look at the overlap. D cubed R. This is equal to D cubed R over L cubed times e to the power i over h bar p minus p prime dot r. And, okay, let me just write it in a different form, dx, dy, dz. x goes from 0 to l, y goes from 0 to l, z goes from 0 to l. Well, if we evaluate this integral, or let me just slightly change my indentation a bit. From minus L over 2 to plus L over 2. This is Kronecker delta mx, mx prime, Kronecker delta my, my prime, Kronecker delta mz, mz prime. So if you have two different eigenvalues, they are uh, orthogonal to each other. If you have the same eigenvalue, this integral just becomes one. Now the problem is kind of what happens when we take the infinite L limit. You see, if you look at the wave functions, the wave functions are kind of pathological. Well, let me just write it over here. Psi P of R is e to the power now here I have a minus i over h bar p dot r divided by square root of l cubed. Well, you see, if you take the l goes to infinity limit, the wave function just becomes zero if you use this normalization, which, well, in a, in a sense makes sense because basically if you look at this wave function, if you take its absolute value, its absolute value is constant. Its absolute value squared is, in a sense, the probability density for the particle to be somewhere. Well, if you have a constant probability density, then the probability density at a given point in a finite volume should be one over the volume. But if the volume goes to infinity, then the probability density naturally goes to zero. But that also means that well, you cannot, well, the wave function is zero, nothing remains, but you end up having integrals over energy which are proportional to volume which also goes to infinity, you get finite answers from this uh, zero times infinity uncertainty. Uh, indeterminacy, let's say. But, I mean, that's not nice to deal with. 
So we rather get rid of all these infinities and zeros in a suitable way. So we basically change the normalization of our wave functions. So what we do is, this is the condition we impose. I just multiply both sides by 2 pi h bar l cube. No, sorry. I multiply by l cube divide by I multiply by l cube divide by 2 pi h bar multiply with L cube for the time being. So I have from minus L over 2 to plus L over 2 dx, minus L over 2 plus L over 2 dy, minus L over 2 to plus L over 2 dz, e to the power minus I over h bar p minus p prime dot r. This just becomes L cube mx mx prime and y and y prime mz mz prime now let me take the limit l goes to zero l go to infinity you see if i take the l go to infinity limit of this part it just becomes a direct delta function this just becomes 2 pi h bar Dirac delta 2 pi h bar cubed Dirac delta p minus p prime. Well, this function is uh, zero if p and p prime are different. Well, if p and p prime are different, you see in the above expression, those Kronecker deltas are zero anyway, and that function is infinite if p and p prime are the same. If you look at the above expression, if p and p prime are the same, all those Kronecker deltas are 1, the result is L cubed, which is infinite. So this is basically why we have this direct delta normalization in the case of continuous uh, parameters. And we usually, in the L go to infinity limit, we define our eigenstates as 1 over square root of 2 pi h bar cubed, e to the power minus i over h bar p dot r. So that their overlap becomes the Dirac delta, as we had discussed before in the case of the continuous spectrum. questions? Now we can give a break. Now after the break we will start the harmonic oscillator. <laughs>